Wood is an author, a speaker, entrepreneurial, and extreme athlete who was the first man to bear crawl up to Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, he was born with a rare uh, disorder called congenital amputation, which left his arms uh, to end at his elbows and his legs to end at his knees. Uh, however, this has not stopped him from leading a very independent life. He does not use prosthetics um, and uses very minimal assistive technology. He is a world-renowned uh, um, speaker and uh, motivates others. He is um, featured uh, and created the documentary, um, A Fighting Chance, and we are so honored to have him with us today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your congenital amputation syndrome? Yeah, so basically, um, I don't know a ton about it, but um, I was born with a condition where the arms and the elbows and legs end at the knees. Uh, I don't, when I say I don't know a ton about it, like I, I don't necessarily know what, what caused it to happen. It was an unknown cause when, when I was born, and doctors kind of tried to investigate and try to determine, you know, what what had caused it, but I guess there, there wasn't like a conclusive answer to it. So um, they, the best guess they said was amniotic band syndrome potentially, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't know until, uh, I didn't even know what that was until I was like 19 years old and somebody got to write a story for me in men's journal and they wrote about amniotic band syndrome and that's, uh, you know, was like a potential cause for, for what happened. So um, that's, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I kind of have like almost like a dimple, you know, on uh, each arm and the way my feet are formed too, then it, it makes sense that that was probably like a, a likely, likely cause. Right. Right. You talk a lot about how you have not used prosthetics um, over the years. Um, was, what was the decision or how was the decision made, um, whether it be your parents or you not to use prosthetics? I think it was more like so we we did we did try prosthetics when I was younger. Um, oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, I wore them for for a while. Like I wore them into um, kindergarten, and um, I tried them again uh, in middle school, but it just like it didn't feel natural. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that like being a congenital disability, like it, it it's something that like you know whatever however my neurons were wired when I was a kid to like you know pick up a toy or pick up a you know glass or a spoon or a fork or whatever or walk around the room like it was just like normal for me to do it without the the prosthetics on and so that's where I think um you know it's it's definitely a lot different as as you know you know and in, inside of the the community where like you're you know born with something versus you know something that you know, happens through an accident or injury or something like that. And you have to kind of like rewire, you know? So. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, in that way, you know, if you're born with something and you only know one way, then it's like, I, I don't want to say in that way, it's, it's like easier because it's impossible to go and compare. Right. But it's like, you only know one way. Right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not like oh, we don't have anything to be able to like go and, and compare it to. So I think in, in that way, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, grateful for the fact that like um you know have only known on that, on that one perspective but I have a lot of you know friends too that have like you know lost limbs in combat and things like that it's a totally different scenario I think when you got to like learn how to redo everything all mm -hmm. over again of course um yeah you know and I when I speak with a lot of um the people that I interview um, especially those that have been born um, with something. I mean, we don't know, including myself, what it's like to, you know, quote unquote, live with, you know, live without deficits. So yeah. um, we all kind of just navigate them as if, you know, they're, you know, we were just, you know, it's just who we are, you know. Uh, so, okay. Uh, how did or how was it uh, fitting in growing up with your family, um, socially, um, if there were any uh, troubles there? Um, for sure there were troubles. I think at home, like my, my family tried to make it as, as normal as possible. 
So that was like, a, I think it just try to not focus on the disability. You know, my, my mom and grandma's attitude was like where the attention goes, the energy flows kind of thing. So it's like, if, you know, to not put the focus on everything that was wrong with stuff. We just didn't really focus or fixate on it a ton and like um, try to make things as just as normal as possible. But I mean, for sure, it was a very different experience when I was out in the world and, you know, interacting with other people and kids, you know, that were looking or staring and, and um, then it was, um, something that like, I think, you know, just kind of had to, to learn to grow to, to accept over, over time and, and realize that like having like a more visually apparent disability, like it's kind of something that like goes with it, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to like, you know, I think a lot of disabilities, you know, are more invisible, right? Like mm -hmm. I think probably the vast majority of disabilities are, are invisible. Mm -hmm. and so it's, you know, can't necessarily look at somebody else and see what they've got going on and, you know, um, but I think it's, it is kind of interesting in that way that like every single person on the planet has a disability of some sort. It's probably the one thing that like unites every single person, right? We all have differences. Yeah, everybody does in, in different ways. So it's like, um, you know, and sometimes I think the biggest disabilities that we have are, are ones that like exist like internally inside of our, you know, hearts, our minds, our ability to like do what we want to do in the world or beliefs or you know, so much of that, right? Like it's the, the non-physical things can be far more debilitating, I think, than, than a lot of the physical ones can. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, when you, you mentioned that you did, you know, get stares and, you know, there were times that were really um, hard. Uh, how did you persevere? I think um, like with the stairs in particular, it was, um, I don't know, sometimes you just had to be able to like laugh at it because sometimes it would just be like super absurd. I mean, when I was a kid, for sure, like it, it hurt, you know, like it, it, it definitely hurt a lot. And, um, you know, sometimes I'd come home and like, you know, cry about it or just, you know, be, be really be really, you know, just kind of emotionally affected and impacted by it. But I think as it got older and began to like learn to accept it more, then it, um, it just kind of changed and shifted. And it was like, you know, there'd, there'd just be some instances where like I just have to like be able to like laugh about stuff. Like there was, um, you know, like one little girl that like just like was screaming that like, um, I remember me and um, Joey, who, you know, like we got in the elevator and they were like screaming, it's a pig, it's a pig, <laughs> you know, and like, and, like, I was just like, whoa, I don't know what to necessarily do with, with that, like this little girl saying these things. And um, it was, uh, but it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty wild just to be able to like sit and be able to just, just deal with that, you know, and I think it's kind of a unique unique experience in that way you know I don't know do you get that much with like people that like just saying, cause, like when I when I was um growing up it was definitely very difficult for me socially um because my right arm um was postured um and it can get postured at times now but I've done so many different types of therapies that it's um it's looser and often I mean because obviously if and when you meet me you know, I, you know, you would notice because clearly, you know, but I often will get, um, you know, people will come up to be, me or after I tell them and they'll be like, oh, really? Like, I didn't know this. Um, <laughs> so it kind of go, yes. But when I was a child, yeah, um, growing up for sure, um, I would get bullied and, um, you know, people thought, you know, oh, that's just, you know, the disabled girl, you know, and they were mean for sure. But then when I went off to college, I realized that like my friends could, or the people that I was interacting with who have become my friends could care less. I mean, like you said, everyone's got their own difference. And, totally. you know, people don't really care as you get older, you know. I think right. when you're younger, I think people have uh, different, you know, they're, they're not, well, they're not grown up enough to really understand 
you know, what, you know, somebody looking different, um, you know, is, you know, to them, it's strange. Um, totally. I think it is also like, I don't know, there is an aspect of like authenticity that goes with it too, though, like that I've always admired inside of the kids, like the little girls screaming, like, you know, he's a pig, he's a pig or something, you know, like it was like super awkward at first to just like, whoa, but you know, at the same time of like, you know, that little girl is like her, she's so free to express herself in that way. Yeah. And that, that's what like comes out. Like for sure there's a better, like, you know, like as you get older and learn more tact and, you know, all that, like that's, you know, critical. But I think that there is a, a freedom of expression inside of like little kids that like I, I admire. Of course. And, you know, but when you're little to be told that you're considered or you look like a pig, I mean, that doesn't feel good. No, yeah, for sure. And um, thankfully, I mean, that in particular instance happened as, a, as an adult and it was still just like, moderately traumatizing of course absolutely <laughs> i mean i totally get it i mean yeah it's difficult um yeah as a kid though it's i don't know it's it's uh i do remember i mean like one of my bigger memories was um being at like uh you know show and tell class and and trying to that was that was actually kind of like the day that i decided that i didn't want to wear the prosthetics anymore was trying to you know, show off a, a toy and not being able to do it and failing and like, you know, had a like army green machine gun that I, I brought to school to try to like, you know, show for show and tell. And like, I was playing with it and fumbling with it and, and dropped it and felt immediately helpless and couldn't jump down and like grab it and pick it up. And, and it was, that was a feeling where I was like, all right, like I want to have anything but that, like, but that feeling going forward so you know taking the prosthetics off was was huge but of course. yeah it's uh it's just interesting how different you know philosophies and parenting philosophies and all that like such make such a huge difference in terms of you know the the outcomes uh, absolutely so how do you navigate the world independently uh you know uh someone actually particularly asked me about typing uh, about putting on your clothes, cooking, eating. Um, how did you learn to do these, uh, these tasks? Yeah, so um, basically just use the ends of my arms to, to type and, um, you know, eat, right? Like hold a spoon, fork, any of that together. Um, just kind of figured it out how to, um, how to, do that fairly early, you know, if I'm going to pick up a, a glass, like I just use the ends of my arms to, to grab hold of it. Um, same with like a, um, you know, a phone, use just the ends of my arms to type, type about, you know, like a pretty decent texting rate. Um, same as, you know, in the typing on the keyboard, um, type about, 50 or 60 words a minute on a, on a typical keyboard, just primarily like to talk about video games again. It's like, was started as that, like just wanting to be able to play video games and stuff. And then had to figure out, how to, you know, type messages in a chat super fast and um, drive a fairly minimally adapted vehicle, just have extended pedals. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a normal, normal steering wheel. Um, and put the seat a little bit closer to the wheel and so yeah it's it's been you know pretty pretty minimal adaptations like you could jump in my vehicle and drive it like the the, the pedals that come up that are extended that I use my, my left and right feet to, to hit the gas and the, the brake but they're basically um you know out of the way enough that you like you could jump in and drive my car so right. um try to keep things as like minimally adapted as possible. I think in, in, you know, it's technology is, is awesome and great. I'm super grateful for it, but it's also, uh, I think can become like a, you know, a bit of a crutch at times um, for anybody, right. Whether you're like, you have a physical disability or not. Um, and then I think when we don't have it, then, you know, we become in like kind of in, in big trouble with that. Right. Like if, if something happened, like, uh, 
you know, God forbid solar flare or something like that, right. That knocks out the power grid. Then like we would quickly realize how, you know, important that is right. to us to have, right. Like the, the, at, like, just access to technology and, and electricity and all those things that we kind of take for granted on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. But, so um, try to try to keep it fairly minimal, and um, it's it's been helpful and you know in that way. So, what other um, assistive technologies, even though you keep them minimal, do you use um, aside from the long pedals when you're driving? I use assistive touch on my phone. Okay. Uh, I think that's, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, there, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, have there been any times, you know, um, when you've been learning these, when you, especially when you're younger, learning how to do things independently without um, devices that you ever got frustrated and, you know, felt helpless? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Many different instances with that. Like I remember um, it took me, 45 minutes to put my socks on for the first time. And I used a paper clip to do it, just a brutal struggle and fight to try to like get the socks on. It was when Joey was gonna come pick me up and take me to a movie. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was a huge battle. But then, you know, eventually like led to being able to like shorten that into, you know, taking 15 seconds, you know, 10 or 15 seconds a sock, you know, to, to put it on just at the ends of my arms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it must have been difficult. So growing up, for instance, with um, changing, you know, did your sisters and parents help you? Um, because obviously- They did, you know, yeah, it's pretty significantly. Um, you know, even like, um, like using the bathroom was like, took uh, a little while to figure out. Like I had a special device that I would have to go and bring to school. Um, and, uh, like literally was like a claw arm that, you know, I'd go and hook onto my arms and like to, to reach down under. And um, it, that, that didn't last for too long. Just that, you know, carrying that thing around was, you know, it was really kind of an issue, so. You are the first man to bear crawl, quote unquote, um, up to Mount um, Kilimanjaro. Can you tell us uh, about this experience and um, the difficulties you encountered, if any, and you know the sense of accomplishment you felt after doing this? Yeah, the, the biggest thing with the, the Kilimanjaro climb that doesn't really get as much, um, you know, I don't really talk about it as, as much, but it was just the, like the lead up to the climb. Um, it was a really significant, you know, challenge just to, to, to get there, to build the team and kind of every, everything that um, went into to preparation for the, for the trip, you know? So a lot of times, like if it's in sports, for instance, right? Like we look at like the championship performance as like the, the thing that we kind of remember that stands out, right? We don't necessarily think about the thousands of hours of, bless you, of just practice leading into to things, right? To, to go and get to the, like that great, that great victory. I mean, even like building the shoes and all that stuff to, to climb the mountain was, was kind of a, yeah, that was a huge, is you challenge for sure, but to get there and to, to have the experience of being there on the mountain, it's an incredibly special place too, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's just, um, probably, you know, like the only place in the world where, um, every, you know, I think natural climate zone is contained inside of one, one environment. You've got, you know, all the way from like, dense green rainforest up to like the tundra on top so it's pretty wild yeah for sure and who did you uh climb with uh i know from the videos that i've seen uh you were with people clearly so was it were there any family members um did you go with a team um friends joey (laughs) joey was there um and was kind of a core part of the team expedition um friends uh um takashi and david filmed it um 
I'm really grateful for my friend Dan who helped with, um, you know, just initially like t- taping together, you know, bath towels on my arms and my feet to, you know, to, to hike the, the mountain and uh, like, um, like just a practice, like Stone Mountain in, in Atlanta, Georgia, where I started. Um, and we, we round out the team. We had uh, two veterans that joined us, Chris and Sandra. And it was really special to have them there as a, uh, like you know, veteran representation on the climb, um, as well as getting to, um, to carry the ashes of a fallen soldier, Corey Johnson and getting to, to leave his ashes on the summit was an incredibly special experience. Um, and, um, no barriers uh, was a really big part of it, um, to help us, um, could get connected to the group that was, um, that we worked with our, their guides, the K2 Adventure Foundation. So my friends, Kevin and Kristen, um, who have a nonprofit to help, um, kids with disabilities and, um, so that's the, yeah, they're like, if, if it weren't for, for them, for Kevin and Kristen, who introduced me to the people that, that, that helped make my equipment, like, and I mean, so many different ways, like helps with the funding, with the expedition helped. I mean, they really like made it, made it possible. And, um, yeah, it took, took a, it was a huge process to be able to, you know, pull all the pieces together to, to make it happen. Um, also left out my, my friend, uh, Geneva too, who's, um, helped with like kind of the public relations and the media. So we had a team of nine of us, um, uh, the, and the American climbers that came over. And then we had a, a team of close to 30 or 35 African porters and that they were really like incredible climbers and athletes and just like, I don't know, it was really special having them there. Um, they were, you know, connected to um, different tribes that lived around the mountain and um, like just, I don't know, I was just hanging with them in, inside of the, the cook tents and stuff, like which was just really, was really some of the most special parts of the, the trip, you know, and um, Yeah, and seeing them too in, in terms and just being in Africa is like just it's just such a remarkable and special place like people that have far less than we have in the U.S. that are you know living extraordinarily happy lives and um, you know just close and connected to their families and enjoying just life in, in so many different ways like in going on a safari in Africa too and, and seeing all the different stuff it was, it was really special. So. Oh, sure. And so how long did it take you um, to get up to the top of these mountains? Uh, the Kilimanjaro climb was 12 days and uh, Aconcagua in South America was 17 days. And then we did a, a few other kind of smaller ones along the way. Okay. And so with climbing um, and all the sports that you do, whether it have been, you know, wrestling, um, whether it be, you know, um, you know, well, climbing, of course, um, but with everything that you do sports-wise, um, how have you uh, managed um, to keep, you know, you know, your elbows and your knees where, you know, your, your limbs end um, from, you know, staying healthy? And this also goes to, you know, just performing um, activities of daily living. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a combination of like I think my my general attitude is to try to like you know use the tools when necessary again. So like with the climbing, like there's no way when I started climbing, I was using bath towels around my my arms and my feet, and then eventually had some carbon fiber shoes, which you know made such a a huge difference, and um. I think that um, in terms of keeping things healthy now, like 
you know, try to build up some level of like calluses and like, you know, just, just use, use my arms and feet on a regular basis. Right. Like, and I think if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. So, um, that's, uh, that's been a, a big thing is just trying to like, you know, if, if, even if I, if I go for a while without pushing my wheelchair for a, a longer distance, then, you know, the, the calluses will eventually like go away and I'll, you know, lose that. And so it's, it's important to be able to, I think, continue to kind of have those, those calluses built up, but at the same time, like accept help when, when other people are, are offering it too. Um, so you do use a wheelchair? I do. Yeah. I use a wheelchair. Yep. So I when, guess that is another massive assistive device that I left out, you know, it's yeah. Yeah. Um, add that to the list. When, so when do you use a, uh, sorry, when do you use a wheelchair versus when do you, um, bear crawl or, you know, use your, um, limbs to move around? Like, I assume, um, like at an airport, you're going to use a wheelchair. <laughs> um, yeah. So like when I'm traveling in terms of speed and efficiency, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Like when I'm traveling a lot, like I'll use the the wheelchair and pretty much don't use it at all at home. Um, just park it in the garage and, and get around and bear crawl there. Um, if I'm, you know, going out to eat at a restaurant, I usually, you know, jump out of my chair and into, um, you know, a regular chair or like a movie theater or something like that. Um, and it's, you know, I realize how fortunate I am to be able to like transfer into, you know, both and, um, it's, um, yeah, the, the chair, especially like I've, I've had, <laughs> I've had it go down on me before in, um, in particular in Greece and Israel had, uh, had my, um, my chair manufacturer with the shout out to, to Lasher Sport. They, um, they, overnighted me a, a, a chair part that like saved me. I mean, it was basically like duct taped and zip tied together and, um, on the trip. So, you know, some of my, you know, some of my, my friends that are like amazing and but hardcore military veterans are like not too gentle <laughs> on the wheelchair sometimes. <laughs> And then, you know, that's to be, you know, it's to be expected. There's people of all, you know, different. Um, I got in trouble for that a lot growing up was, uh, <laughs> you know, having like, even, you know, Joey or whatever was, would like ride, you know, in the, the back of the wheelchair, like you would, you know, jump on top and ride on the, the battery, the um, battery pack and the electric chair. I used an electric chair for a long time growing up and, um, but it was kind of, yeah, just just funny because my parents were constantly on my case about that, just having them wreck the uh, <laughs> the, the electric chair. It's like ten thousand dollars or something. It's as much as a car, but um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's. I'm trying to think now if there's any other like major adaptive devices that I've left off the list because I would say a wheelchair is a pretty significant one. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I actually wouldn't have even thought about a wheelchair until I've, I've seen your videos um, because a lot of what you're, you know, a lot of what is out there, you know, of you, you're, you know, crawling. So um, yeah. I think it was in a TED talk or something about getting off the wheelchair, whatever the case was. So I, and until you brought it up, I wouldn't have even thought about it again. Yeah, you know, no, it's... You do almost everything without your wheelchair in a lot of ways, you know what I'm saying? That's, uh, yeah, and it, it kind of goes back to, like, the parenting philosophy, too. Like, it was, like, the, called it the Jedi mind trick, right? Like, they didn't focus on the disability a ton, and so, therefore, like, it, it, it didn't become a huge deal. I think that, like, there really is something to, like, where the attention goes, the energy flows. If we put our focus right. on everything, you know, it's, right, if you just put the focus on the disability, then it's, like, it becomes a bigger deal than it, than it might need to be, I think, um, not saying that, you know, I, I, we wouldn't have times, you know, where we talked about it and acknowledged it. Like I wasn't in, in denial of the fact that I had a disability, but I think that that was a really critical aspect of, of how they raised me was to just to not, not put too much focus on it. And I think that if you do, then it can be become a huge limiting factor. Um, 
you know, really try to encourage people to, to have, you know, a good solid knowledge base about whatever it is that they're, they're facing. Right. But in, in, maybe even more than, than your doctors. Right. But like, don't like allow those limitations to, to confine you, you know, and to push the limits as, as far as you possibly can with the vessel that you've been given. Absolutely. I totally get it. And, you know, my parents were very supportive too. You take clearly the physical challenge everywhere you go on a daily basis um, with what you do, climbing, you know, obviously physically and so forth. Where do you think that comes from? I mean, you are a man, but like, where do you think that comes from? Because not every person has that um, strength and determination. I, I don't know. I think I, I, I love, like, I love the feeling of it for sure. Um, it's, you know, something about like the, the, the competition, like, especially like makes you better. Like climbing is one thing, right? Like it's, it's competition with yourself, but like, I think wrestling or jujitsu, for instance, like those things are like a, a fight with another human being that is, you know, it maybe, maybe this resonates with you, maybe not, but like, if you have somebody that's like trying to hold you down as, as hard as they can, and you're trying to get away, you know, it's like in that, the feeling of that, like, it's a very intense thing that like brings out something different inside of us that, um, you know, that, that I think, it's a level that I've, I've experienced it. Like I, I, I can't necessarily get to with like a, like a barbell um, or a kettlebells or something like that, that I would use inside of like a gym or even, a, you know, a mountain, like for sure the mountain climbs have, you know, it's a different kind of feeling. It's like a, like probably like a feeling that's like, closer to just like that, that red line of, of exertion, uh, and again, it, it gets in a longer thing. So it's like a war of attrition. And um, the, you know, wrestling or jujitsu is like a, like a, that intense, you know, fighter battle with, with something else that like just takes it a, a, like a different kind of like, like a deeper, a deeper level, um, which is fascinating because I think that, you know, see it all throughout nature right that like somehow like in the the fabric of like existence like that it's it's kind of like coded in there that like all of nature you know struggles and fights in some way even you know, even plants you know and competing right like the, the the plants inside of the rainforest are some of the most like highly you know competitive <laughs> species you know on on earth right like it's, yeah. it's just iron sharpens iron and in, in, in different ways so like i think it's that's a big aspect of what what I really enjoy in those sports. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, and so it can be sports wise, it can be, um, you know, on a daily basis, but what it has been uh, the easiest that's come to you given your limitations and then what has been um, the hardest or a challenge for you? Hardest has been probably confidence with with girls okay. for sure as, as when I was growing up you know in high school and stuff like terrified to like you know talk to girls or have like the confidence to be able to to do that um felt like a trainer asking my senior prom date out was probably one of the most terrifying experiences of, of my life <laughs> you know but getting to to do it was, was like when she said yes it almost just like shocked me into um you know realizing that like wow like oh, i was going to go to prom with this girl like that was just was pretty wild um the um i think the thing that's come the easiest I don't know if, if this is will necessarily make sense, but like, I think things kind of like, it's just the revelation that like things are what they are. 
and so even like if, if we, I, it, I'd fight against it a lot, but like, I remember praying to God when I was a kid that like, I would just wake up and have arms and legs. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think as soon as I kind of like got over the fact that like, that just wasn't going to happen, then it was just easier to accept that. Um, because I, I think I also know a lot of people that spend a lot of time, you know, wishing that things were, were different. Um, I, I think just accepting things for what they are, like allows us to then be able to, you know, in, enjoy the time that we have left more, you know, even like, you know, accepting that like the world right now is upside down and chaos and, you know, between, you know, just uh, all the challenges that are, that are going on. It's like, just stops me to like sit outside and like and enjoy the butterflies to like sniff my puppy's ears, you know, and like enjoy her. And, um, and, and realize that like whatever will be, will be. And, and to have that, like that sense of peace, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think a lot of people through, um, you know, the situation and I've spoken about this with other people too, um, you know, really appreciate quote unquote, you know, the meaning of life and, you know, what, you know, we kind of take for granted, you know, whether it's going to the barber, you know, for men or, you know, getting your nails and toes done for women. Um, yep. We didn't have that for three months, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean. You don't know how good it is it. until it's gone, right? Like, yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately, like we, we live that way. Yeah. Right. Uh, you preach the philosophy, no excuses. Uh, can you tell us about this philosophy? Yes. Um, however, <laughs> I would say there are, you know, or it's, it would be better said that like there are always excuses of course but i mean i've I've never met somebody that's like overcome their excuses like completely you know but at the same time like it's we're we're capable of you know i think i do believe we're capable of much more than we give ourselves credit for i mean there's a routine excuses that i'll make on a on a daily basis but then like i look at that i'm like you know those are opportunities for for growth and i can you know can do better tomorrow and you know live live differently like it's i think it's more a mindset to like to just not complain about i mean it's okay to it's okay to complain in fact like i'm I'm actually learning to like complain i think it's like a big it's been okay. a big goal. <laughs> um but to like really um i don't know just no excuses like just to, to live life and, and and enjoy like this time for what we have I and mean, that's like there, there couldn't be you know, tied to what I just talked about of like everything that's going on right now with COVID and all the challenges in the world and just you know not knowing what the, the future will go and bring it's like take responsibility for your own life and like go and do something you know and just don't complain like just go and, and figure it out and you know I think hard times create, you know, tough people. And maybe that's what we'll have to go and go through to be able to, to get to the other side. I don't know. But um, I think, you know, one way or another, we're going to figure it out. Right, of course. But specifically, you know, I know that in a lot of your speeches, you talk about no excuses in this philosophy. Um, correct? Or yeah, I- yeah, for sure. Okay. I just want to make sure. So what um, to extent, um, are you referring to? To what extent? Meaning, what what is the philosophy around the no excuses to go and reach your you know fullest potential? Like, there's nothing that you can't that stops you. Um, I know we spoke a little bit about the COVID situation, so I just wanted to know more on a general level um, what you thought of it. Or- I think it's. I think it's it's, it's relative to each individual, right? Like it's excuses that 
that you make in your life, given the challenges and circumstances that you have, like are going to be completely different than, than mine. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but getting it down to that like very individual level and saying like that you're, you and I are, are, are two totally different individuals with two totally different sets of circumstances, but to like, so effectively we're the only ones that can truly tell the truth to ourselves about those things, mm -hmm. about the excuses that we're making, but to like have an honest inventory of our lives and figure out like what, what is it that keeps us from, from, reaching our, our own personal limits, Zenith, you know, whatever that is. And like, what's the, what's the incentive to do that in the first place? I think everybody's going to answer that for themselves. I don't think that's, you know, it's, and I think I did, I have that philosophy that like it's within each of us as individuals, as opposed to like looking to things to the outside to, to make it better. Um, I think it's a internal control, right? That like, we are the captain of our fate and, you know, and, um, the masters of our own soul. Of course. I, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and hopefully other people, um, that are listening, uh, and watching our interview, um, can really, you know, take in this philosophy and also I hope so too I kind of wonder sometimes like I, I've <laughs> this might not be super motivational but I've, I've, I've often like I've just questioned you know even free will right and it's it's been um, I don't necessarily know how or why or what like it but it seems as though somehow things are to some degree a bit on um like a, like a, a course or a track like each, each of us you know like like your path and your journey like i'd be super interested to know like all the like the details that like led you to like this moment in time right and it's kind of is like if one thing leads to the next if somebody doesn't say something to you if somebody doesn't like nudge you this way or that way or, or, or whatever, like it just kind of like, just changes the, the course of things. So like, where does that come from? You know, it's, it's, there's every, every action has like a, like there's something preceding it, right? Like there's, there's mm -hmm. something that like led to, to that occurring. Right. So it's like, I do think that there is like an aspect of like choice inside of like the, the, the present moment, but certainly, you know, at least that the past is written is, is the, the future too. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, uh, it's to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> uh, so I know clearly as we've spoken about that, uh, you do not use a lot of assistive technology. Uh, other than wheelchairs. <laughs> right, exactly. uh, but in terms of inclusion and accessibility in the world. Um, Adaptive pedals. So I didn't, I didn't say that one too. That's another one. Yeah. Um, but in terms yeah. of inclusion and accessibility, um, where do you think it stands, you know, in the world right now? I am really proud of, of America, I think, in terms of, you know, the, the, the way in which We've, we've dealt with that, I've traveled around the world and, um, you know, been to a lot of developing areas of the world and that, um, you know, it's just harder to get around. And if I didn't have, you know, the full kind of physical faculty to be able to do it, it could be really difficult to go in some places without like a, you know, like a, like a, one of those tank style wheelchairs that can climb mountains and stuff. Right. Like it's, um, but yet, yeah, I, I do think that um, my concern is that, you know, we can we definitely move towards making things better. Mm -hmm. However, like, like there's, there's like, uh, I think in, in some people's minds, like the idea that like anything like less than perfect is unacceptable. And like, I, I think that like, there's no such thing as perfection. 
and like we are you know i mean ourselves individually and like and like the world in a macro scale and people right like we're we're we are imperfect creatures connected to perfection. Of course. But like it's, um, you know, there's like perfection is the enemy of, of progress, I think, seeking perfection. I, and I am a perfectionist, you know, one of the main reasons why I've only got one book out, you know, is because I've just like second guessed myself a million different times, you know, and, and writing another one. Um, so it's like perfect is is kind of an illusion, and I think that that's that's what I wish would would change more along the lines of like the the rounded edges on the world, right? Like I I've got you know little friends that are like born little versions of of me, right? That are quite like empty. Someone who's dwarfism or a midget, or you talking no. about? No, I'm, I'm not talking about like, little like that way. I'm talking like little like like young like age like they're like oh, little okay. kids that are like like little me like they look very much like I did at a younger age. They're like four or five years old that are out you know playing you know t ball and and things like mm-hmm. that. And, and in some communities they're allowed to play, but like in other communities, um, they aren't. And mm-hmm. so it's you know in 1997 going back a little while, but like my coach had to like fight super hard for me to have an opportunity to play football. They weren't going to let me do it. So had he not done that, like my life would have taken a very different course, a very different direction. Right. Um, It like, I think it would have turned out probably in an interesting way. It could have been like a, you know, maybe a computer programmer or something like that you know like mm-hmm. code for video games or something or, or maybe something in, in in totally different direction but um it wouldn't have been in the physical side of things like there never would have been any of the mountain climbs or all that like and it's just because like i think the attitude of people wanting to go and take like a rounded edges and like rounding the, the things you know the corners to try to make things as safe as possible and there was a certain amount of risk with like letting me play, you know, and, and, and playing football. The way I'd tackle people was I'd literally take my helmet and I'd smash it into people's shins as hard as I could to try to take them down. And um, not only is that mostly illegal to tackle people that way in like normal football, um, it's also extraordinarily dangerous from head injuries and like in spinal injuries, right? But had that not occurred, then I would have never wrestled. Had I never wrestled, there would have been no, you know, MMA or weightlifting or, or mountain climbing. So it's it's just an interesting kind of like causality in, in that way, right? Like it's, I think fighting for for people to have opportunities to be able to, you know, to, to, to play, you know, and, and, and that's it, you know, it's a, it, delicate balance there too because i get like on the on the flip side we were talking about the other day was with um my family talking about um you know the um i think it was the oscar uh the uh the south african who um ran with the prosthetics that uh that like he was accused of like having an unfair advantage over everybody because he's running with the prosthetics I, I, I know who you're talking about. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't, um, I can't figure out his name right now, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you know the story. I mean, he also had the big murder trial and all that. With his yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, right. So like, but he is an example of like kind of the first time where somebody had like a physical, you know, the first time, but he was an example of somebody where like there was like a potential argument for the fact that he had like a um, intense, you know, uh, mechanical advantage, right? Like, and there was, there was an argument in, when I wrestled as to whether or not, like, I had a huge unfair advantage um, in wrestling. And, you know, I found that interesting because a lot of the parents, when I first started, like, they were saying that, you know, it's basically borderline child abuse that my mom and dad were, were, you know, making me do it and making me wrestle because I was so bad at first. And then eventually got to be a lot better that people were saying that I was, like, unfairly advantaged. 
for the kids. So it's just kind of funny to see people's like reactions change over time. And there are just no easy answers with those kind of questions. It's just a, an interesting conversation to have, I think. For sure. Um, now, lastly, by sharing your story, which is very inspirational, um, what do you want others to take away? I hope that they take away that like, no matter how like big you feel the odds are stacked against you, that like you can, that you can be the captain of your fate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, I think that's a big aspect of it. Like, you know, guide your ship and your life in the direction that you want to see it go and, and fight for that. Right. Sure. I think that's a great message. Well, Thank you. So <laughs> wonderful, Kyle. I've enjoyed this. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>